All right, this morning we're going to be talking about the book of Revelation. Now, a lot of times I find that, and, and my purpose in it this morning is to, uh, to encourage you to begin to dwell into it, begin to study it. A lot of people um, are kind of intimidated by it or think, well, who can really understand it? There's so many different interpretations. There's a lot of symbols. Sometimes we might consider it a little dark. It's a little scary. Uh, but it's so important because it, it, you know, it's, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or another way to say it would be the unveiling of Jesus Christ. You know, throughout... Um, Throughout the Bible, you know, starting uh, in Genesis all the way through, we have a gradual uh, revealing or unveiling of who Jesus is. I mean, if you think back in Genesis, you had Abraham who, uh, remember when uh, the Lord showed up with two angels and they're going to Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, you now he knew him as Lord, but he didn't know the fullness of him. He didn't know the man, Christ Jesus. And then you think of Moses, says that he spoke face to face with the Lord. And so as we go through the, the scriptures, you see a, a slow unveiling, especially when you get to the New Testament, as you begin to see who this person is. It's like the, the Old Testament gives us the promise, and then we find out in the New Testament, the promise is the man, Christ Jesus. Fully God, fully man. And so there's a, a, a revealing, unveiling of who he is. And as we look at Revelation... That's what it is. It's really a revelation, a full revelation. We have Genesis at the beginning, revelation at the end of who Jesus Christ is and really what his battle plan is for the end of the age. And I think it's important for us to begin to realize and to understand and look at those things. Not that you would have every I dot and you know every T crossed and your understanding, but that you would know those things. You would know the signs so that when they begin to happen, you go, oh, this is what that scripture meant, because I think we're all going to be surprised. There's going to be surprised. I don't think anyone has it completely figured out. We all have our different time charts and our little charts and little, you know, of the seven bowls and the seven trumpets and all the different parts of it. But what you do need to be familiar with is just be familiar with the scripture itself. Um, and Daniel was actually the first one, you know, who... Uh, who gave the term, you know, son of man, which is what Jesus used more than any other term to describe himself. He called himself the son of man. Again, fully God, but fully man. Now, in Matthew 24 and in Luke 17, we have what we call the uh, Olivet Discourse, which is basically where the disciples ask Jesus, okay, what's going to be the signs of the end times? What, what's going to be the time of your, of your coming? And he gives several different things throughout the, both those scriptures. And uh, one of them, it says, as it was in the days of Noah. So you think, and it goes on to say, you know, they were, they were eating and drinking. They were giving in marriage. They were, in other words, many were living life as normal. So basically saying they were clueless about what was about to happen, that the earth was about to be destroyed. And in Luke's version of it, Luke 17, and it says that uh, not only will it be as the day of Noah, but it will be as the day of Lot. And you think, well, okay, what's the difference? Well, there was a, a militant homosexual move going on at that time. So you have these, uh, also in Noah's day, there was giants. And it says the violence filled the land. And so those are some of the, some of the things to look for. I noticed this week, I don't know if you guys saw it in the news, uh, some Israeli uh, archaeologists have just discovered, uh, first time in 60 years, more of the Dead Sea fragments. Uh, and this is the first, like I say, it's been 60 years since they had discovered those things. And those were written by a group called the Essenes. Now, the Essenes were very uh, interesting. They were... Uh, you had three different sects. You have the uh, Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and you have the Essenes. Now, the Essenes came from about the second temple period to about 100 years before Christ. They were the ones who, again, copied the Old Testament 
all the Old Testament books except for East or Esther. That was the only one they didn't have. But they also wrote a lot of a lot of commentaries on the scriptures. And there's some interesting facts that I find really fascinating. It said they used a solar calendar instead of the lunar calendar, which is what most Jews used. They called the Pharisees and Sadducees sons of darkness, and they called themselves sons of light. That's pretty handy. They also said the age of Torah would be until about 75 A.D. So if you think about it, uh, you know, Jesus, probably about 33 A.D., was crucified. But at the same time, the temple wasn't destroyed until uh, 70 A.D. So depending how you figure it, they weren't that far off, maybe 40 years. They said an age of grace would follow the age of Torah. And that age would last until, which is the present age we're in, the 2075. So if you take their figures, and, and uh, again, they didn't have A.D. and B.C. at that time, but when you calculate it out, that's what it comes to. Uh, they'd be about 40 years off, so say 2035. So it's interesting just how they figured out. They also believe there would be two comings of Christ, while most Jews were only looking for one coming, right? They predicted the year of Messiah's death at 32 A.D. So most people say, you know, it's 33. That's really close. They said Messiah would rise from the dead, which he did, and that the Messiah would be for the Gentiles. Now, another thing they said was a Benjaminite would explain everything. So who was that? That was Apostle Paul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. So I thought just some fan, fascinating facts about this group. They usually lived in, in community, and they were, uh, you know, did a lot of fasting, a lot of praying, but they were, they were on to a lot of things that most of the Jewish community was not. All right, let's go ahead and turn to, if you have Bibles up to Revelation chapter 1. Now, in Revelations was written, most modern scholars believe it was written between 94 and 96 A.D. Obviously, the divine author was Jesus. The recorder was Apostle John. Uh, John, they think, was born in 6 A.D. He was the youngest of the apostles, of the 12 apostles. You know, he called himself, you know, the beloved disciple. You know, the one that leaned on his breast. And he was in the inner circle. If you remember when Mount of Transfiguration, Transfiguration on Mount Hermon, he was there with James, his brother, and Peter. So it was Peter, James, and John who were the inner circle. He was, of course, in the garden on that Gethsemane at the time of Jesus' passion coming. Now, all the other disciples, uh, in fact, his brother J James was the first disciple to be martyred, and all the other disciples were martyred except for John. Uh, they believe his, his tomb, that's what they officially say, his tomb is in uh, Ephesus, because he was a leader of the church of Ephesus uh, for, for many, many years. And so as we start this in, in verse 1, let's just read the first three verses, start out. We're just, I'm just going to go through mainly the uh, first chapter and then talk about one of the churches of the seven churches. There's a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place soon. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the word of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So 
so again, it's the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. But if this is the only book where it says, the blessed be the one who reads it, and blessed is the one who hears it and takes it to heart. So there's a blessing that goes along with reading Revelation, trying to understand it, trying to dig into it. So that should be an encouragement to dig into it. Now we'll go to verse 4 through 8. And it says, To the seven churches in the province of Asia. And again, as we're talking about the province of Asia, that, that is modern-day Turkey. Actually, western Turkey. It says, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Look, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, as you read through Revelation, you're going to find a lot of sevens. We're talking about the seven churches, seven lampstands, a lot of different sevens through all throughout. And seven is, a, is just the number of completion. And it talked there about the seven spirits and if you go to Isaiah, you're going to have to turn it if you want, but Isaiah 11, uh, starting in verse 1, most scholars believe this, these are the seven spirits, but it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From the roots, a branch will bear fruit. Obviously talking about Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord rests on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and power, the Spirit of knowledge and and the spirit and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And again, also in Revelation, you'll find that many times Jesus actually will give you the interpretation of what those signs or what those symbols are. So let's Go to, uh, let's see, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he had been exiled to the island of Patmos, which is an island about 40 miles out in the Aegean Sea, which was a penal colony that the Romans would send their political and criminals there. And it says, On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstand was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a glorious sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, 
and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his brilliance. So he sees, John sees the glory of the Lord. And this is, you know, his, his way of trying to express what he's seen. Such a glorious, awesome Jesus. In fact, I'm going to stop there. I want to look at a, uh, another verse in, in uh, Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel experienced actually the also song saw the Lord in a very similar fashion. Daniel 7. Verse 13. He says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, all nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So again, that's something we have to look forward to, that all the nations... His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And as we go through Revelation, you see the rest of the story. As things begin to unfold, you begin to see the great hope that we have, that this man, Christ Jesus, that he will rule and he will reign, that all death will be done away with, all tears will be wiped away. So it's a glorious book. Yeah, there's going to be some speed bumps along the way, but uh, it's all right. Now, another one out of that same passage I just read, uh, I want to read Hebrews chapter 4, because it talked about uh, in his, that, he, that he had a sharp, double-edged sword. So if you look at Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, In verse 12, it says, For the word of God is a living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes. Of him to whom we must give an account. So again, that sharp double-edged sword that penetrates, you know, and judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Another way to say that, judges our motives. Why we even do some things that we do, what's our true motives behind that? Okay, in verse 17, this is John's response after seeing the, the glory of the Lord, he said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet, as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So as it uses the seven stars or the angels, angels can also be uh, just a simple word for, for messengers. 
But he tells you, he gives you the interpretation of what what those two things mean, the, the golden lampstand and the seven stars that are in his feet. So, most scholars believe that the seven churches in Asia, or what we modern-day Turkey, that each of those, one, I guess they uh, pretty well accepted interpretation is that they actually represent different ages throughout church history up to today. At the same time, any one of these could be present in a, in a particular church. But I want to give you the time frame. And Ephesus, the first one that is mentioned, most scholars believe it goes from about 33 A.D. to about 170 A.D. Now, Smyrna is the second church, and it goes from about 150 A.D. to about 312 which would be about, you know, the time of Constantine. Although, uh, you know, many people think Constantine was the one who legalized Christianity. It was actually not Constantine. It was an uh, emperor after Theodosius who, in 330s, legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. Pergium, from 313 to 538. Now, Thyatira, Thyatira from 606 to 1514. It was kind of called the pagan church. Sardis was called the dead church from about 1514 to the 18th century. Now, Philadelphia is kind of known as a revival church from 18th century to about 1900. And then the Laodicea, which is known as the apostasy church from 1900 until now. Now, at the same time, you know, in that, again, in that first song, we talked about, you know, a bride, we being the bride of Christ. There is a, a yet another church, which would be that church, which is going to be pure and spotless bride that is preparing themselves for the coming king. And while we are in the Laodicea age, and there's many churches and basically, that age is about compromise. It's about uh, doing away with some of the, the harder subjects of the Bible that we don't really want to offend anybody. And so you begin to compromise and anything that would cause offense, you don't talk about. And so there's a slowly uh, walking away from the true things of the Word of God. Now, it's interesting in Laodicea, and that's the only one I'm going to look at this morning. I did a, a one on Ephesus. It's probably been six months or a year ago, maybe. But Ephesus was a church that, you know, that, that Jesus said, uh, you, you've lost your first love. And went to the history of that and how that actually at the time was a revival center. And none of these churches, none of these seven churches today exist. You know, it's way less than a 1%, less point some percent of Christians that are even in Turkey anymore. Now, Laodicea was a banking center. It was a trade center. They also refined gold there. They have an aqueduct that brought water from yeah, actually a long ways. By the time it got there, coming from the mountains, it was actually lukewarm. So you see some of these same things coming up. Now, in 60 A.D., Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake. And the Romans uh, offered to rebuild the city for them. And they said, no, we really don't need your help. Because they were so rich, so well off, that they built the city back themselves. So that's kind of the background. And that also is the only church, if you look at all the seven churches, that's the only church that the Lord doesn't give a comb combination. In other words, you know, each of the churches says, you know, uh, I, I see your deeds. These are good. There's, there's none of that for Laodicea. So what I want to look at, starting in chapter 3, just that one church, the church at Laodicea. And we're going to kind of read through that. Because, again, that's what many people believe is the church age that we are in now. So verse 14 Chapter 3 says to the church 
to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see those whom I love I rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent here I am standing at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with him and he with me to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I, I have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the first thing says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. You know, there was not a fire for the Lord. There was not a hunger they were just going through the motion. It's kind of like in Timothy where it says, you know, they had a form of godliness but denied its power. They were going through the motions, but there was not any fire. And it says, you say you are rich, and in the natural, they were rich. But spiritually, they were broke. And you do not realize that you are blind, wretched, poor, naked. And then he gives this command, I, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, in other words, rich spiritually, and white clothes to wear, again, the white clothes symbolizing purity, holiness, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. And then verse 19 is a promise sometimes we don't particularly like. But it says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So we should expect sometimes when, the, you know, as we begin to get out of line with the Lord, to expect a little discipline, which is not always uh, enjoyable at the moment but it's for our own good. So we should expect that as a father who loves his children. Now the next part of this is when it, he says, here I am standing at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now many times we use that verse for evangelism, but that's really out of context. Context is he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. He's talking to people who have got off the path of righteousness. But he's given that, that option. He says, you know, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking at your heart. I, I want to commune with you. I want to have fellowship with you. Come, take advantage of this. And then to him who overcomes, we have this promise. I will give the right to sit with him on a throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I had read a, a, a uh, I think it was out of Barna, uh, talking about Christianity uh, in the United States, and it was saying that uh, actually, those who profess to be Christians, only 19% had a biblical Christian 
outlook. In other words, it would be more like, uh, yeah, I'm Christian. I mean, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Muslim. So I was born in this country. I guess I'm a Christian, you know. And so you get down to 19%, that's pretty small. You know, that, that's what we almost call a remnant, right? But those are the people that the Lord wants to, to, again, to bring forth a church that is a pure, spotless bride preparing ourselves for, for his coming and the glory that goes along with that. He is so glorious and awesome. And I think as we look through the book of Revelation, and, and as you go into chapter, uh, you know, after chapter uh, 4, or actually after chapter 3, you know, like in verse, uh, let me find it real quick. Uh, well, at right, the first is, After this I looked, and there before was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So he first gives the, the description of the seven churches and, and dealing with that. And then from chapter four on, it's about these are the things going to happen after that as we go towards the, the, the end of the age. And again, the answer to you know, many of the, of the church fathers would say the Laodicean church, their main problem was slothfulness, a term we don't use very much anymore, but slothfulness meaning lazy, not pushing in, not hot. But the answer to slothfulness is not legalism. What it is is it's about intimacy with the Lord. It's about spending time with the Lord. It's about presenting yourself before the Lord, praying, Asking the Lord questions. Sometimes it's, it's sitting in silence before him, waiting to hear. And sometimes it can be very frustrating because you wait and you don't seem to hear anything. And yet the Lord wants you to sit there to receive what he has to show that you have. And it said, we have the patient endurance he's given us. But he wants to develop in us that intimacy with him. Well, it's not about a religion. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about the glorious man, Christ Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, and his beauty, his awesomeness. And he wants to reveal that to us. And then as we begin to go through the rest of Revelation, we begin to see this is the plan. This is God's, you know, Jesus' battle plan for how he's going to bring the end of the age about. And so as we begin to study it, Look at the points. Again, I don't think you need to worry about having exactly figured it out, but you need to know the points and the scriptures so that, again, as they begin to happen, you will have understanding. You go, ah, that's what that scripture means because none of us are going to have it completely down. Just as the, you know, the first coming was a surprise to most of the Jews, there's going to be surprises in this for us also and how it happens and how it unfolds. But I want to encourage you not to back away from Revelation, but to get into it, to begin to go for it. Because it is the unveiling of the glorious man, Christ Jesus. And I think that's one thing we as a church don't really realize, and it seems funny to use that term beautiful, but how beautiful that, that man is, how glorious he is how loving he is, what it's like, what his, you know, every time someone sees him like John or Daniel, you know, they fall at his, fall on their face because of his glory. So awesome. So awesome. So glorious. And we get to spend eternity with him, basking in his glory. There's a new Jerusalem. You know, it's not so much the Jerusalem here on earth today. It's the Jerusalem above. That, that 1,380 square cube city that will be coming down upon a refurnished, re re, uh, what would I use the term, re replenished earth and a glory. And it says there will be no sun or light because the, the Son of God will be the light. His glory will be so awesome. 
we have eternity. There's so many things ahead of us that, that you know, it says eons. So these ages beyond what we know now. As the end of the age comes, yeah, it's the end of this age, but eternity is before you. And glory, and just right now, joy, just think joy is in there. She's seeing things that we can only imagine. Glorious thing. You know, if you've ever talked to anybody who's had that, those type of death experiences and have actually been to the city and they talk about colors, colors that they can't even explain, that are so bright, so glorious. They talk about, you know, one guy was talking about the, the grass was alive. You'd walk on it and you'd press it down and come right back up and, and just everything was so crystal clear and the glory and the, the power, you know, and the love that they felt. Just such overcoming love. And that's what's ahead of us. And that's what's revealed as we go through the book of Revelation. It's not something to fear. It's something to embrace. And if we are to be that generation, if it's that time, that we want to be ready. We want to be, you know, seeking that. We want to, we want to embrace what is coming and know that it is going to be a glorious, glorious, awesome time. And yeah, there is going to be some very uh, times of, of tribulation. There's going to be persecution. We're going to lose some battles, as I said before, but we win the war. It all ends up, we win. So even though it may take our lives, we win. But we're all dying anyway. So, you know, sudden death, sudden glory. You know, and that's how, that needs to be our, our concept. Sudden death, sudden glory. You're going to a glorious, awesome place. And so I want to encourage you this morning just to be, you know, don't back off from, from reading Revelation, begin to get into it, begin to study it. I mean, just begin to ask the Lord questions. You know, he likes it when we ask questions. Lord, what does this mean? This doesn't make any sense to me. I remember, you know, when we first started the, when I first started really reading the Word, trying to study it, it's kind of like, you know, Lord, this is pretty boring. You know, I'm not getting a lot out of it. Uh, I like meetings, I like worship. That was kind of fun, exciting. But the Word, you know, it wasn't until after I began to apply myself and over time that all of a sudden it began to come alive. You know, it began to speak to you. It became that, that double-edged sword. And so I want to encourage you all to, if you're not on a, a, some type of systematic uh, Bible study, you need to do that. Now, I've done one since, I think, 1984, uh, except for a couple years when I tried a couple others. But with it, I go through, it actually goes through the Old Testament. Uh, so a daily reading would be like three, three chapters of the Old Testament, one reading of the, of the New Testament. And the reason for that is just because the Old Testament is like three times larger, right? Uh, but with that, you also go through the New Testament twice a year while the Old Testament once. But it puts the, the Old Testament in chronological order, which is, is, I think, very helpful because people get lost. You know, when's this happening? What's going on? Or if you have a reading in Kings, you also have the same one in, in uh, Chronicles. So it, it matches stuff up or... If you have one that refers to a psalm, it does that. But some type of system where you're going through the Word daily. And just stay in there. And if, if you're not used to it, the Word will begin to speak to you. And you'll begin to have more and more of a hunger. Because if you're just coming in here for, you know, 45 minutes to get a message, that, that's not sufficient. You need to be doing it yourself. The Lord is able to teach you, to show you. And, you know, even today, after I've you know, gone through the Bible however many times, I still find things that it's like I never saw before. All of a sudden, that, that scripture will, will stand out. It's like, oh, yeah, where was that? I never noticed it before. So I want to encourage you all to, to get into the Word, and especially as we're talking about Revelation now, not to back off from that, but to, to get into it and know that it's a glorious, awesome future. A lot of times I seem to, to spend preparing people for the rough times, the things that I think are coming, and I think we're going to have more shakings. 
you know, we're not, we're not by any way done. But at the same time, I want to focus on the end, the glory, the glory that is yet to come. And you know, as you, as you go through, I've done some studying on the gods, back to Moloch, back to Baal, all the different, from the, from the biblical times, and, and really the only thing that's changed is the names. It's the same thing as you go through Greek mythology or the Roman. It's the same gods, the same principalities, the same powers. They're still around. They're still here. There's still spiritual warfare that's going to be going on. But we win. We win. And so I want to encourage you all just to get into the Word, study it, and just be transformed by it. And always remember, you know, it, it's not, again, it's not legalism. We need to be changed from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, lives within you. He's able to guide. He's able to direct you. He's able to convict you. He's able to lead you into all truth, it says. He will show you things to come, it says. So ask the Holy Spirit to begin to give you wisdom, begin to uh, give you understanding, and, and he will do it. In fact, in James it says, you know, ask for wisdom. He will give it liberally. If you don't doubt, ask the Lord. Lord, I need wisdom, I need understanding. And he's going to give us more and more. You know, in Daniel it says that you know, told, the Lord told Daniel, seal up the things until the end time. We're about to get things unsealed. And more revelation is going to be coming. And part of that also is, I, I feel firmly belief that revival is coming. But it's in the midst of shakings. It's in the midst of things in the natural getting darker. But revival is coming, and a third great awakening will come to this nation that will sweep in thousands and thousands of people and across the world. So that's our hope. That's what we're here for. You know, we're here for others. Our, our destiny is sealed. You are a believer in Christ Jesus. But there's many out there who don't. All right, so let's... In with a word of prayer, and we'll have a song at the end. Anyone needs a, a prayer for healing or whatever your need might be, or, or just a, a prayer for a, a relationship that's going on that you've had, you know, you're struggling with, that something has happened, feel free to come up and pray. Whatever the need is, the Lord, the Lord is able to meet us, and the Lord wants to begin to give us little little snippets, little twinkles of the revival that's coming. So the more that we lay hands on the sick, the more we're going to see re recovered. So Lord, we just ask right now, Lord, we just say thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for that book of Revelation. That, Lord, you give us your end-time plans, your end-time purpose. And, Lord, as we're heading down that road, Lord, we ask that you'd give us understanding you give us truth, you give us wisdom, that you'd give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying and what you're doing. Lord, we say we love you, we give you our hearts. Lord, we ask, Lord, for the more, more love, more power, more of you in our lives. Lord, we want to be transformed from the inside out. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Do a work within each one of us. Mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus. Make us that pure, spotless bride that is ready for his son. We want to be like the five wise virgins who added oil. We want to be filled with your oil. So Lord, I ask now, Lord, that you would just do a work in our lives, we give you the glory. We give you the 